Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC Fight Night 213 uh, to take place October 29th. The card has finally uh, come together. It started off as, I think, 10 fights, then it went to nine fights, then they added a couple. And only this afternoon was was uh, DraftKings pricing up for the Rodriguez versus Weems fight. Um, but uh, we're all ready to go. And we'll just kind of take a look at this. I, I feel as though... Um, this card is, how do I put it? I think DraftKings did a really nice job pricing everybody, but I do think it's kind of by accident. So this, this is what I mean. Sometimes you'll have these fights that kind of slip in here that are say like 90, you have a $9,500 fighter who's a minus 1500 favorite, right? And also who is, you know, uh, a favorite to finish uh, in the first round. And they priced them at 9,500. The lack of dynamic pricing makes for a really, really poor, uh, honestly, a really poor DraftKings experience. Um, and it shows a little bit of ignorance on, on behalf of the pricing models to not realize the, the difference between a minus 300 favorite at, at 9,300 and a minus 1,100 favorite at 9,300. The other thing that DraftKings uh, and FanDuel also, they, they don't take into account like legitimate upside and, and, and styles and, and fantasy point goodness out of these, out of these fighters, even in the other sports, the NBA and, and baseball, they, they don't just assign pricing based on win odds. And that's essentially what it looks like they're doing. They're not taking into account the fact that one guy at 8,100 could be have incredible KO upside, incredible grappling upside, and just rate to score that much more. But they're still going to put him in eighty one hundred if he's a pickup. Right? That's just the way they do it. And oftentimes it makes for extremely easy plays. Um, now, just because they're easy plays doesn't mean that they're easy plays. Because again, you know, just because something looks easy, that also is going to mean that the other parts of the DFS community are going to be all over it and they're going to be highly owned. So that's always the cool thing about these contests is that no matter how good of a play something can, can seem, there's always that balance that has to be struck between something being a good play and being something that's too, that's too owned. And um, that's usually the battle when it comes to, uh, to comes to these, to, to, to MMA pricing is, figuring out what the good plays are. And that's usually not that difficult based on, you know, the, the inside the distance props and things like that and styles, which are pretty, pretty well known throughout the industry. Um, but balancing that out with um, uh, balancing that out with, uh, with, with ownership and ownership fame and things like that. On this particular card, uh, DraftKings, their pricing is actually very efficient. Um, now, I'd like to give them credit to say that they did it on purpose, um, but it's just because the way these fights have been kind of put together and these matchups, you're just not getting any real price uh, price mistakes. Like you're not getting a you know a seventy one hundred dollar fighter who's a two to one fav two to one underdog, but yet still is you know uh, even money to finish inside the distance, or or more to the point, maybe like plus two fifty to inside finish inside the distance which we do see from time to time. And those are in fact misprices. I'll give you an example. Um, a couple of weeks ago, you had Jordan Wright versus, uh, who was it, Tudor Tudorovich? And Tudorovich, I mean, the pricing was at like 8,900, 7,300. And the thing is, is that Jordan Wright, he was 7,300 and they priced him as if he was just a regular two to one underdog. And he was only, he was a two to one underdog. But the thing is, is that Jordan Wright's win condition was so heavily weighted towards first round uh, KO that the 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 thirty three percent of the time that he rated to win was just going to score an incredible amount of fantasy points. So, if you had true dynamic pricing and you really wanted to test people's you know uh, ability to, to to handicap these slates, you would have made something like Jordan Wright like seventy six hundred or something like that. Um, and yes, what you then would have to do is have uneven pricing because then Todorovic, he still was a great price as well. He was still was a great play, but you could have made him 9,300. I don't know why you feel as though it has to, um, you know, uh, 
converge around that 8,000, 8,100 level uh, for every fight. I mean, tennis doesn't do that. Tennis doesn't have everything be the exact average. They have very dynamic pricing, but I think MMA can do the same thing. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, this week is is really test your ability to 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 crunch the numbers and and you know figure out actually what the good plays are. And um, I'll give you a kind of an example right off the bat. So th th there are three. There are three $7,100 fighters. I'm going to talk about them all kind of the same. So you have this Hooper Garcia fight. You have this Holmes Park fight. And you have uh, this Vandera Cortez Acosta fight. Now, give or take, they're all, all about the same with respect to money, money line, right? Uh, Cortez is at minus 215. Um, you have, well, Park's a little more, like minus 250. Hooper has steamed up to minus 300, whatever it is. And, and you have the other guys on the other side being priced about 7,100. So you have to think of which, if any, of these 7,100 guys are in play. And the thing is, is that you look at all their inside the distance lines. Let's look at, again, we're just focusing on the underdogs here. You look at Garcia. Garcia inside the distance is is plus 450, but that minus 750. So that means, means probably, and I could argue about, I could argue with you guys about this, but I think what this inside the distance props means is that he actually has maybe a 15% chance to, to finish. Uh, and the reason why is I do think the, all of these, all of these bomb prices are just our, our, uh, are, are bad value. I feel as though that what they do is they, for, for these types of illiquid markets, like no one's going to play, you know, Garcia, not inside the distance at 750. So really these lines are just made to get people who want to play something, something big to play something like Garcia inside the distance, but put a number up there at 450. But I think the reality is the price of something like that should probably be closer to 600 plus 600. So that's why I'm figuring maybe about a 15% chance for Garcia to finish. Um, and you compare that to the others and that you have Holmes. It looks very similar, right? Holmes inside the distance, plus 650, plus 380. It's pretty much the same thing, right? And then you have Vandera inside the distance, pretty much the same thing, right? Uh, maybe a little bit better, uh, plus 300 as opposed to minus 450. So... Same thing. I say maybe about fifteen percent actual chances of finishing. So, and all these guys are probably priced pretty efficiently given given those given those those inside the distance props. You know, um, Vandera has he actually is a little bit more expensive I think than the others. His win odds are a little bit better. Whatever. Um, so the difference between all three of those plays is very very small. Um, I think that none of them rate to be a particularly good play. Um, and, and if this were the type of card where you needed to play guys like that, I think you kind of have to eat the negative EV of each of those plays and just kind of do it. Right. Um, but as we get through this card, I think you'll see that you don't really need to play those guys. And which is good because none of them are particularly good plays. Um, the, the one of those three underdogs, which I will, and which I will, uh, discuss a little bit more is is jared vandera and and the reason for that is in addition to ins his inside the distance prop they there's also this narrative kind of going around that he could if he were so inclined get a significant advantage rapidly okay and this has been of the x you know 100 of, of of hours spent on content in this industry I would say a good seven percent of the top of the content hours was spent discussing this very point. You know, like like does Vandera actually have grappling upside in the first place? Number two, will he actually decide to undertake that 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 game plan? And I've heard Jared Vandera call all the you know the names that you're not allowed to call people who are not very intelligent throughout the course of this you know the course of the last week. You know, I'm um, saying that I just can't count on this guy. He has a low IQ and I'm not going to get into all the slurs, whatever. But th this idea that, you know, 
if he only knew how knew to knew that wrestling was going to be the you know the way to win he would do it and thus he would have a really good chance um so how you want how do you want to handle that that little bit of narrative is separates these three plays just a little bit but i, I will give you this bit of advice uh, i've been i've been doing mma dfs for a while now and I've seen so many fights like this where the entire DFS embedding community wants a guy to fight a certain way because in their minds, that's the way to win or in their wallets, that's the way to win or in their analysis, that's the way to win. And it is very rare that a fighter does something that he just doesn't do. Okay. And, and the fact of the matter is, is that, Vandera hasn't gone for these takedowns in forever. Um, and it reminds me, what was that fight? That Strickland um, uh, Pereira fight. I mean, everybody knew. Everybody knew. The whole DFS community knew. All that Strickland has to do is, is go for takedowns, don't get into a striking match, and he's got a shot, right? Um, and he didn't because he's, that's just not what he does. You know, he was, he, you, you saw in his eyes, he was just going to go after this guy. And you saw it in all leading up to it. And, and people just try to talk themselves into thinking that a, that a fighter is going to do something that he just hasn't done. We're going to get to Trajan Gore. We talk about, we'll talk about him a little bit later. So just be careful to talk yourself into this, these narratives and talk yourselves into these game plans that, that you would employ or that you hope that the opponent would employ and they just don't. I mean, you think about this. So Vandera, two fights ago, he was fighting Olenek, right? And he took Olenek down and he was ground and pounding him and he got reversed and he got subbed. And you know what people said? My God, what an idiot. You know, what an idiot. If the only thing you knew is that, that Olenek was going to sub you, how could you go take the guy down? So then the next fight against Sherman, people were saying, well, I'll go take him down, take him down. And then he doesn't take him down. And they're like, oh my God, what an idiot. You know what I mean? So, so, so it's not exactly, it's not exactly that easy, you know, to expect fighters to do what you want them to do or what you think is going to be their, their path to victory. So um, uh, that, that's, I guess, where I wanted to start this analysis. Now let's get back into it and let's start with the fight that was just added, which is the one kind of outlier fight uh, in that the, I actually shouldn't say that his Rodriguez's money line is a little bit higher than the top guy it, for the most for the majority of the week, you just had a whole bunch of these two to one favorites. And only in the last couple of days did some of these others just kind of steam a little bit. So you see a uh, Hooper, he was minus like 220 a little earlier in the season, I mean, early season earlier in the week. And who moved, he moved up to minus 300. So he's now kind of like that, that, that extended, you know, uh, over uh, uh, call it, uh, underpriced uh, fighter relative to his win odds. And, and Weems kind of comes in as, as the second guy like that. I'm sorry, uh, Rodriguez. So let's just take a look at the inside the distance props here. And fight doesn't go minus 150 or so. But let's just take a look, obviously, at the Rodriguez side of this. What Rodriguez winning inside the distance is about a plus 110. In other words, given the VIG and given everything like that, I think I would say that based on the you know these projections are based on on the public's uh, creation of this uh, of this uh, of this prop line to say the least uh, i would say rodriguez is about a pick on to a you know 6 to 5 dog to finish inside the distance okay um, now keep in mind also that most of the ko's and the finishes inside the distance are weighted towards the first round so I know what people are saying. Well, just because he finishes inside the distance, that doesn't mean he's going to finish in the first round. It doesn't. But I would say, I mean, I can show you the prop, the prop lines, whatever. But fifty percent of at least of the KO uh, of the KO upside of these guys is in the first round. Right? And it's very rare, actually, that a guy will get a, a third round KO. So um, the and the reason I bring all that up is because Rodriguez is going to need a first round KO to pay off his price tag. Um, I would say 80, maybe 90% of the time. And the reason why is because he's not the type of guy that's going to get those 110, 120 point scores 
absent the first round of knockout. There are other guys on the slate we'll get to that can generate, you know, really, really big fantasy scores even without the first round, uh, even without the first round uh, uh, KO. But only those fighters that have big grappling upside and have have ground and pound upside and things like that. This is not the type of fighter that's going to get that. So you're really dealing with that probably about be six to five to finish inside the distance. I would say probably a two to one dog to finish inside the first round. So it means about 33% of the time he finishes in the first round. Now of the time he finishes in the first round, how often is he optimal? Um, I think that on a card like this, say it's, a good 60% of the time, you know, maybe a little bit more, you know, again, it depends on how he finishes. He finishes just with one punch in the, in with uh, one minute to go in the round, you don't really score that much. If you finish with one punch and he gets KO'd in the first 60 seconds, you get that 120 points for the, you know, for the, uh, for the one minute bonus. If you get a whole bunch of, 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 of strikes followed by a late first round KO, now we're in the 110, 120 range as well. So, um, overall, I mean, I think he's kind of a an okay play, you know, not a not a perfect play, not a great play, not a good play. He's he's an okay play. Um, Weems, I, I just again because of the way dynamic pricing works, you're just really not supposed to play plus three hundred underdogs, right? It, the only way you're supposed to play plus three hundred underdogs is number one if they have an insane inside the distance prop. Um, meaning that of, of the times that they win, so much of it happens in the first round or with the kind of upside that you need. Um, and the other is if they're it's so low owned um, that it gives you that much leverage. And more to the point, you need a situation where the opponent is that high owned as well. So a lot of this is gonna come down to, to ownership and we're gonna update that a little bit later. But I don't think Rodriguez is going to be the, you know, the highest owned fighter on the slate. Um, so you're not getting you know triple, quadruple leverage with Weems. So I think Weems is basically an X. So now we get to uh, the, the the real high upside favorite on the card, uh, and that would be Chase Hooper. Um, Chase Hooper has a combination of literally everything that you want. I mean, you have an extremely strong win win odds right like about minus three to one which is again you know it doesn't mean he wins 30 you know uh 75 of the time because vig's included so maybe maybe 70 percent, something like that but nonetheless very very strong win odds um in addition to that in addition to that his inside the distance prop is extremely strong it's it's basically a pick up you know minus 110 minus 120 hooper inside the distance so about 50% of the time he finishes. And again, most of fin most finishes are kind of slanted towards that first round. So you so it's it's a very similar type of thing to to um to Rodriguez that we who we just discussed. But a couple of 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 points here that 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 propel Hooper to that kind of more elite status. Number one, he's cheaper. Number two, his inside the distance prop is a little bit better. And number three, most important is that he has additional ways to score points, that being from the grapple. Um, he's, you know, he, he's, he can get takedowns. He can reverse. Right? That, that's worth points. He can get control time. So in addition to the inside the distance prop, in addition to the points he's going to get from finishing, he can also rack up a lot of points um, in, in control time, in, in ground and pound and things like that. And what happens is, is what, what's so important about that is even if you don't get the finish, even if he gets, if the guy's so durable, he gets through all three rounds, he can still, Hooper can still score a hundred plus points. Okay. Um, Hooper in his last fight, for example, he didn't get his finish, I think, till the third round, but he was just mauling him so much with his takedowns and his, uh, ground and pound and, and control time that he broke the slate into, into a million pieces. He scored, I think, 150 fantasy points. Okay. So, so that type of upside is extremely difficult to fade. So that's why, I mean, Hooper is to me clearly the best play on the slate if ownership were not a thing right now. I imagine that ownership is going to be a thing. I imagine ownership is going to be 
you know, really, really strong in Hooper's favor. So, you know, when you're building your GPP lineups, you probably don't want to pair Hooper with, you know, with, with a whole bunch of chalk. Um, but there's no denying that Hooper is, is, a, is an elite play given everything that I just said. Um, Steve Garcia at plus 225. Um, again, uh, real odds are a little bit better than that. But one thing that he does have going for him that, what's his name, that um, uh, Weems did not, besides the fact that he's more of a, uh, has a better winning chance, he actually does have some rest um, in his back pocket. I want to see his back pocket. When, when he has it in his back pocket, that presumes that he could do whatever he wants. And if he really needs to, he could he could take it out. I mean, he's a two he's a two to one dog, so it's not as if like oh, I got all these tools. And by the way, I could also wrestle. I actually think that that's probably Garcia's best path to victory. Um, Hooper has shown s- some fishy takedown defense, and, and and the reason why he does is because he's so elite with his with his submissions that sometimes he just feels as though you know no big deal, just you know just submit him from bottom but think about it you know if you are garcia and all you remember here he's a little older a little more experienced hooper's young and if he can find just one or two types of takedowns and one kind of position that he can keep hooper off his ass so to speak i mean this is this is a this is a legit path to a, a decent score on draft kings and not only that but you know they say styles make fights and i've seen this a lot with people that can wrestle is that they just need one type of takedown that the other guy can't deal with, and they'll just keep going back to it time and time again. So um, I, I feel as though that this fight is 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 yes, Hooper is clearly the side, but I I would I would I'm certainly going to sprinkle a little bit of Garcia um, into my lineups. The thing is, as we get through, I don't think I'm going to need to, but I I would definitely play Garcia before Weems and some of these other guys. Okay, moving on to Jun Young Park versus Joseph Holmes. So this is, again, another minus 250. But but what's different about this is, number one, he's more expensive than Hooper, even though he's got a lower chance to win. And not only that, you look at his inside the distance, bro, um, it's extremely poor. I wouldn't say poor, but it, it's pretty poor. I mean, he's, he's a over two to one favorite to not win inside the distance okay and that's really really difficult to overcome the only way you can overcome it though and you can is as i mentioned if you have those types of multiple takedowns and 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 grappling upside and it's possible that park can get there in that fashion i mean um park has has taken guys down multiple times and you'd like to think again you'd like to think that that's the path of victory he would choose is to just keep taking Holmes down and continue to control him. Um, it is a lot to ask, though, at 92, excuse me, 9,300. I mean, because you're going to need literally at least one takedown round and probably either four minutes of control time or that Algermain Sterling thing where you just keep on getting those, those strikes, you know, when you have them in the body triangle. Um, and you can rack up points that way. Um, but, but Park compared to Hooper is really a difficult, it's a difficult comparison, you know, actually, actually it's an easy comparison. Hooper on the numbers is just a much better play. And the question is going to be, as I kind of alluded to before, is how much ownership are you willing to eat uh, on Hooper over Park? Um, can you play both of them? Yes. It'll be a little bit difficult, but you can do it on this card. You have to drop to some underdogs, but that's okay. Um, but to, to get a $9,300 fighter to get there on, you know, sort of a takedown approach is kind of tough, you know? Um, the one thing I will also say about Holmes, I mean, he isn't only a point of plus 195, so he's not exactly underpriced, I get overpriced. I guess he's fair. Let's look at his inside the distance prop. I mean, Plus, again, it's very similar to these other guys I spoke about earlier, so it's not really great. Um, I guess it's possible that, you know, Park comes in for a shit a takedown, Holmes gets a guillotine, and, you know, that's possible. Um, but it's probably not something I want to I do too much of. 
Um, so for me, if I play park, I mean, one thing I will promise is that it's going to be low owned. I, I think, I mean, how could park not be low owned with Hooper? Obviously a much better play in 200 um, cheaper than him. So um, that's the one thing I will say about park. It will be low owned, but I, I just, I just don't think I can get there. So this next fight is, is one of the reasons why I don't think you need to, um, to, to play too much stars and scrubs. I mean, you can, but, but this fight was added recently. And this is, this is a very, I, for me, a very easy fight to deal with. You know, you have Mota, who is a minus 165 favorite. Uh, he's probably, they're both priced reasonably. You know, what is it, 8,600, 7,600, whatever it is. And you look at the inside the distance prop, and you do have Mota as relatively decent inside the distance prop, maybe a minus 140 after Vig. So maybe 45% of the time he finishes inside the distance, 40% of the time finishes inside the distance, which is totally reasonable at 85, 8,600. And I think he's a really strong play. And on the other side, you have the ultimate win condition situation. You have Cody Durden, whose path to victory is almost exclusively uh, predicated on his ability to take Mota down and keep him down. He is does have that wrestling background. That's what he goes for most of the time, except for his last fight where he didn't need to. Um, and so you, you have these, these win odds at plus 140. And, and the thing is, is that if in fact he does win, it's going to be because he gets these takedowns. And when you get takedowns, you get fantasy points. Um, so he, he doesn't need to win uh, in, inside the distance. As a matter of fact, I mean, w winning inside the distance is actually not bad. I mean, look at this. He's, he's plus 400 inside to KO inside the distance. I mean, you think about this, his, in, his win condition, his inside the distance prop is just as good as those 7,100 fighters. And yet he has all the takedown ups, right? And he can he can get there and smash in a decision. So I think both these fighters are really strong. And it's going to, you know, start our parade of mid-range that I think it's going to make a lot of sense. Um, the one mid-range that is not going to make any sense to me is going to be the Andre Orlovsky. Actually, he's not even mid-range. The one that I will say about Arlovsky is you are getting line value on him. Um, actually, you're not. I was going to say the opposite. Sorry. You have Rogerio, who is priced at, um, let me see. I think this was the only fight. Let me just make sure. Maybe, maybe that's wrong. Does Rogerio have line value? Let's just take a look at what his price is. Um. No, not really. Sorry. So he's 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 eighty nine hundred compared to seventy three hundred for for uh, Arlovsky. So there's no real line value on either side, and Arlovsky's inside the distance prop is hopeless. Um, it is plus seven hundred inside the distance. I mean, he's going to be no owned, but he's it, it, he's only going to win the fight thirty three percent of the time, and when he wins, he probably doesn't doesn't score well. So it's not what you want. The Ruggiero side is somewhat interesting, I guess. He is inside the distance, um, plus 140. I mean, and if you want not, it's minus 190. So I guess that's okay. Not great though. I mean, the one that I will say again is, is, is a lot of it is in the first round. So I, I, I guess that you could make a case for him being a decent low own play. But I, I'm just going to have to find a way to get up to, to Hooper or something like that in, in a case like this. Um, but I think Rogero will get some ownership because uh, that is a decent decent inside the distance prop. Um, but it's not my favorite of that range. And we'll get to that in a minute. So now we get to Roman Delise against Philip Paws. And this is a very, very fair, listen, very fair fight. Um, very fairly priced. And I think you can make a case for either of these guys. I mean, let's let's take a look. You have you have a minus 170 and plus 140, and, and the pricing is is very fair. You have a what's it, 7,800 and 8,400. Um the inside the distance prop actually surprised me a little bit because the Hawes one, I, I was expecting to see this. You know, we're at about you know, minus 200 or so, minus 170. It's you know, uh the leads he's tough. You know, Dawes, Hawes has, you know, is not the, I mean, he's a finisher, but he's not the greatest finisher in the world. So I think this, this, 
this line is somewhat fair. Um, the, 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 the side that I thought was going to get more love would be the, the Delizzi inside the distance prop. I mean, Delizzi inside the distance is something really low. It's, it's, where is this? Plus like 400. They have like the same as these 7,100 fighters. I don't know, man. I mean, I, I was at, I was at Hawes' most recent KO against uh, Chris Curtis. And the lead says eight and one. He's got some KOs. I don't know. I mean, listen, this is not my job is to figure what which of these lines is undervalued, but I have to think that the, the lead say inside the distance line is probably undervalued. So uh, if I were going to impose my own uh, predictions into DFS, you know what that would mean? It would mean that I would think the lead say is a very strong, super strong player because I think he's being, I think his line is being mis interpreted by the public which means he's going to be low owned relative to his ability to put up a good score so i guess that's what i would say about this fight i think both sides are perfectly reasonable both sides make sense and one thing i will say is don't sleep on the delice side and i have this feeling that delice is going to be sort of unpopular as a result of this because people are going to run projection models and what projection models do is they take into account all these all these props and um, Delice is going to show up as probably not that great of a play. I don't know. I, I just, I, I just kind of have a feeling that that this line is bad, um, and that he has more finishing upside than than the line is indicating. Which means he probably has a better DFS play than than the than the projection models would indicate. So I, I guess all this is a way of saying that I do like the Delice side, um, but I, I do like both sides. Um, then you have Jacoby Roundtree, and this this. Again, to me, I don't mean to say this is easy, right? Because because DFS is not easy. Um, but excuse me. Oops. But it's kind of an easy fight, right? You, you have two kind of well-priced fighters around eighty three hundred, right? Eighty three hundred seventy nine. Is that what it is? It's yeah, eighty three hundred seventy nine hundred, and. You have action, you know. You, you have Khalil Roundtree who gets a bunch of KOs, and you you look at his inside the distance line. And I actually thought it'd be higher, but you have Khalil Roundtree inside the distance is you know plus three hundred. First of all, that's another one that I think is just a little bit weird. Uh, I, I don't I don't think I've ever seen Roundtree finish a fight. I mean, win a fight by decision. I mean, he's only plus 150 to win. How is, I don't understand how that inside the distance line is so weak. But, so again, I, I think Roundtree's an extremely strong play. I imagine he's going to be pretty popular. But, um, and then you have on the other side, Justin Jacoby. I mean, his inside the distance prop, I actually think is pretty kind of bad also. I, I would, I think it's a little bit uh, too ambitious. I mean, they have him plus 140 to win by KO. Um and plus 130, or maybe like with big plus 150 inside the distance. I would I would expect more of a more of a what you might call a kind of a point winning fight from Jacoby if he were to win. But the, the, the inside the distance props are really, really leading his way. So I'm not gonna fight that. Uh, I'll I'll play both sides of this. Uh, and I think that again, it's important that you get to these mid-range fights on this card because the I think the I think these seventy one hundred dollar fighters are really bad. I really don't I really don't want to play those. And you don't have to if you play these mid-range fights. All right, so I mentioned I would talk about um, about the Treshawn Gore fight um, with respect to uh, us expecting and hoping things happen, which just don't happen. Um, so you have a pretty decently priced fight. You have Friend at 8,700, then you have Gore at actually at 7,500. This is actually, I think, a little bit of line value for Gore. I mean, not much, but kind of a little bit. Um, I would expect that for these prices, it'd be more like, I guess it's close enough, 80, yeah, 87, 75. I guess that makes sense. When you look at the inside distance props and you see friend inside the distance, about a minus 200. Uh, and then you have Gore inside the distance about like a three, uh, basically the same as those 7,100 fighters <laughs> that I talked about earlier. So I think both these, both sides of this fight is really poor. Um, I think Friend is okay, but you compare him to Jacoby, who's basically the same uh, cheaper price, 
much better inside the distance prop. Um, I, I couldn't I couldn't play this fight. Now, again, it's a mid-range fight. So, you know, I was saying that you do want to play these, but I just think the numbers are too poor. And, and the thing that I, I had brought up about Gore before is that I've heard a lot of content this week. And this is what I've been hearing. Like, they, they're saying Gore, all he has to do is just be more aggressive. All he has to do is let his hands go. He's got the talent. All he's got to do is not be as so tentative. And I've heard a lot of steam for Gore this week, but they've been saying this about him for, for forever. And it's, it's, it's again, that DFS curse, that, that betting curse that you want a guy to be something that he just has not shown that he could be yet. So, you know, I think that Gore is going to actually get some ownership that is just kind of unwarranted. You know, I think that, Friend is probably going to get some ownership as well, but I just think his, I think his his win condition is sort of poor. I don't think he's going to get a bunch of takedowns. Um, I think he'll win a striking battle and and not really score all that well, you know. So uh, I'm probably off of that fight. I mean, I'll play maybe a little bit in, G, in, in MME, but but and I think of anybody, I might have the, I'd have to just see whoever's the lowest on really, and, and that's the side I would take. All right, so I kind of alluded to this fight a little bit before. So you have Cortez Acosta against Vandera, and this fight's been broken down in so many ways throughout the community. Now let's 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 just get back down to basics a second. Right? Forget about what you think of these fighters. You you have Cortez Acosta inside the distance as a pick, right? He's literally 50-50 to KO this dude. And, and as I mentioned earlier, the majority of these KOs come in the first round. So you have first round. You have some in the second and less likely in the third, but he's about a 50 50 to do this. And his price is what? 9k. Right. So the fact is he's a, he's probably a, he's a better price than Rodriguez. Right. It's just, that's just the bottom line. He's a better price than Rodriguez who's 9,400. So it's somebody that you want to play or probably over Rodriguez. Um, then again, you look at the, at the Vandera and we talked about him earlier, you know, his, his, Fight doesn't is he his fight doesn't go to decision or his inside the distance line is just terrible. You know, it's it's like tw- maybe 15, 20 percent of the time. That's, I don't know if that's going to be good enough for me, you know. Um, and again, the only thing that's kind of keeping me from from axing him is because I don't know, it, it, because of this narrative about the takedowns. And yeah, you know, the, here's the thing. If he does get a takedown, if he if, if this Cortez is like a fraud, and and Vanderas trips him in the first round. You know what's going to happen? He's going to jump on top of him and and just ground and pound him for the whole round and score 150 fantasy points. You know what I mean? And and so that that, that is why I'm not able to X him out of my player. I can X out Weems. I can X out. I could actually X out Garcia if I felt like it, right? I could X out Holmes if I felt like it, but I couldn't X out Vandera just because of that variation. Um, because if that variation hits. You just win. You know what I mean? So um, uh, that's, that's I guess, all I'll say about this fight. So the final fight, well, there are two more fights. First, there's the main event, which to me is the least interesting. But, uh, I really like this 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 Max Griffin, Tim Means fight. And, and the reason why is we, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago with respect to, who was it, Martinez? It was Jonathan Martinez. Jonathan Martinez had a, an inside the distance prop that was a little worse than everybody around his range. Everybody. It was just a little bit worse. Than you had people at 86 and 8,500 that were getting pounded. And you had people at 9K, 8,900 that were getting pounded. And my philosophy was that Martinez was just going to be overlooked in the range. And, and not overlooked because people were dumb, because there are others that were just better plays. But remember, MMA is variance. And, and if you can find that, that salary black hole, you know what I mean, where people are just not playing you in that range, you can take a lot of liberties with your projections. And um, Martinez worked out perfectly. I mean, he smashed at almost no ownership. And I think Max Griffin is a perfect example of that. Max Griffin is... 8,800, okay? And he's a minus 180. I mean, see again, seems fair. Let's look at this inside the distance prop. Inside the distance prop is 
it's kind of poor, right? Minus 260, something like that. So it's a little bit worse than a lot of the guys in his range. Certainly worse than Moda, right? Who's much cheaper. Going to be worse than Jacoby. It's going to be worse than the guys above him for sure. But Griffin has a little bit of wrestling also, a little bit of takedowns, and he's got the low ownership, okay? And I think that whatever his ownership is, it's going to be even lower than it's supposed to be because of that salary black hole. And I think he's basically an elite GPP player. And I'm going to go right back to this whole concept uh, on this card. And I'm going to be significantly overweight on Max Griffin. Um, main event to me is not particularly, you know, exciting. I mean, you're, it's perfectly fair. I mean, you have two guys that are pick'em fighters. They're priced to pick them. Five round fight. And they're both going to be just stri striking each other the whole time. I mean, I'm sure it's perfectly well efficient. You know, you run these two projection models. They're going to have uh, winning by decision and a medium projection of maybe 85, 90. I mean, you know what I mean? It's probably going to be good enough. You know, and, and the thing is, is that I think the reason why you want to play this fight on this card is again to uh, make yourself avoid playing these 71s that I really just don't like today. Um, I really don't have any opinion on any of these guys except to say that Arnold Allen really just really, you know, crushed my soul last time he fought. Talk about this some other time. But he was literally the only one of two fighters I didn't play on the whole card. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll show you why. I mean, like, this is, this is so. This is so tilting, but this is what happens. This is why MMA has all kinds of variants. All right, we'll pull this up here. So here's Arnold Allen going into his last fight. Okay, I just wanted to show you this before this last fight. Okay, these are his fantasy points leading into his last fights, even in wins, even whatever. You had one, two, three, four, five, seven wins in a row. Here are fantasy points 76, 59, 57, 77, 59, 69. Decision, sub, decision, 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 decision. He was the second to last fight before the main event, and I had basically the nuts. All I had to do was have this fight not score well, and this is what Arnold Allen did at age. Just crush. Crushed me. Um, so, in any case, but I don't care. I mean, I'll, I'll play both these guys. They'll, they'll, they'll get into my line. It's probably 50-50. Whoever wins, I'm sure will score fine. Maybe not well enough to listen. Maybe not a hundred points, but I think on this slate, you're, you're more. It's more important that you get those six wins in those mid range, <laughs> those mid range fighters, than having to go down to those seven Ks who I really just don't like at all. Um, okay, that will do it. Uh, good luck, everybody, and uh, let's get it.